Today is April 2nd, 2017. My name is Chris Tuma, and I'm interviewing Judge Fred Garza Jr. for the VOSIS Oral History Project. I just want to let you know that this interview will be housed in the Nettie Lee Benson Latin American Collection, and if there's anything that you don't want to talk about, you don't have to. So if I can start out with some preliminary questions and some questions about your childhood. Sure. Uh, can you describe what your life was like growing up in Mission, Texas? Actually, I grew up north of Mission, uh, seven miles north of Mission, or two miles north of Alton. I grew up in a farm. Um, uh, it was a, rural, a, a part of the rural community. And uh, actually, uh, I'm just a farm boy. I mean, just doing all kinds of things that farm boys do. Uh, riding tractors, riding go-karts, falling into canals, falling off trees, off barns, and so forth. Okay. Just a farm boy. Why were you called tomato boy as a kid? I was called tomato boy because we farmed tomatoes for many, many years. That was our main product. And as a little boy, uh, I would pick tomatoes and then sell them on the side of the road on, on fruit stands or, you know, or vegetable stands. And um, I did pretty well as a tomato boy. So uh, I did that for a good, I would say for a good maybe five or six years. I started selling tomatoes when I was about seven years old. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, did your family push you to pursue an education? Yes, they did. That was like the rule of the house. Um, uh, education is a must, and we're going to see to it that everybody gets one. Okay. How did the Rio Grande Valley shape your values? Rio Grande Valley, well, we all have our relatives and culture here. And so, uh, I mean, you, you, you grow around your aunts and uncles, your grandma, your parents, and uh, they're pretty much uh, telling you what's right, what's wrong, mm -hmm. and uh, you just follow up. And what was your neighborhood like growing up? My neighborhood was really not a neighborhood. I mean, our neighbors were like a mile away from each other, um, so it was not a real neighborhood. Uh, we had to go in either horses or uh, tractors or uh, drive off the highway on some land when we were not old enough to have a driver's license to go talk to our friends, uh, but we didn't really live in a neighborhood. Okay. Uh, what is a memorable encounter or conversation you had with a community organizer or advocate? Okay. Uh, I would, I can think of two here. Okay. Uh, uh, one of them was uh, a Brinkley Oxford. He was an attorney who also went to the same elementary school I went to, but way, way before. Uh, this gentleman was a community activist, and I learned a lot from him. Uh, he taught me how to go out there and help out the people and uh, go out there and uh, make the best of, of, of something that, you know, just isn't there or is lacking. And uh, I had conversations with him uh, quite a lot when we were incorporating the city of Alton. And then a retired congressman that we used to have out there, Kika de la Garza, I also had conversations with him. and. Uh, uh, to me, he was a man that got along with everybody because even in Congress, when uh, the Republicans took over in 92 and they had a contract for America, he was still there. But the Republic Republicans themselves couldn't agree on things, and so they would go to him and say, Kika, would you please talk to Newt Gingrich and uh, have him do this or do mm -hmm. that? And he was like a mediator. And so that told me, like, hey, this guy gets along with everybody. He's got a lot of friends over there, no matter what party or affiliation. And so uh, uh, I learned a lot from him. Okay. Um, how did things get to how they are today in relation to education initiatives in South Texas? Well, uh, today I'm happy to say that the Higher Education Coordinating Board is uh, finding out that we do lack a lot of, a lot of uh, professional uh, schools here. Uh, I know that when I was growing up, there weren't none, and then when we try to tell them, hey, we're, we're lacking some professional schools here, engineering, law, what have you, medical. Uh, we were pretty much ignored. And I know that the population and the numbers were here in the valley, but they sort of didn't want to fund us yet. But just recently, a year ago, I think uh, that board went ahead and recognized that, yeah, there's a need for many education uh, uh, opportunities in South Texas. And as you well know, we now have a medical school. Uh, Texas A&M is going to open up a branch in McAllen. And so uh, they'll, he'll be, it'll be competing with Pan-American University. Mm -hmm. 
And so I think that will produce the next law school. One of those two is going to say, you know what? Is it going to be you or me? We're going to get a law school here. Have you guys faced any challenges in keeping activism f for those kind of initiatives strong to create more resources related to education down here? Well, yeah, currently I haven't, I mean, you, you, need, to learn, you need to know one thing, that when, once you become a judge, you're like that 400 pound gorilla that is caged up and you cannot really take sides and take, uh, get emotional and things like that or work for this party or that candidate. You're, you're limited to what you can do ethically. But before that, Oh, we had challenges. I mean, we, we, we were involved in so many uh, uh, battles. Uh, one was to incorporate a city, which was a colonia for many, many years. One was to try to keep the law school alive. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, and others were uh, elections. Uh, we had uh, water district elections uh, where uh, we wanted to elect some of our people in there because the water supplies or districts were ignoring the community and were not going to give them uh, drinking water, for example. And so we figured, well, if they're not doing their job, maybe we need to get our people in there. Mm -hmm. So we had those kind of elections too. We had a lot of battles. Okay. Um, what was your experience in elementary school like? Mm, real happy life growing up in the farm, going to school. It was a small school. Uh, there was a one room first grade, one room second grade, one room third grade. We're like 30 students, all up to seventh grade. So that was like my elementary and junior high school together. But in school, not much activities, just learning. Uh, not great facilities either. But the best thing about going to school actually was going home from school because I couldn't wait to uh, uh, do something, uh, get a gun or something, <laughs> go rabbit shooting or whatnot. <laughs> so I would do my homework in the bus and when I would get off the bus, I had no more homework to do, so I would just play around. Awesome. Uh, what about high school? High school was an uh, eye-opener for me because, like I said earlier, uh, junior high was one room, seventh grade. Uh, eighth grade was one room, eighth grade. And then after that, we got bused to Mission High School. Boy, it was an eye-opener. We were now like 350 students, and I hadn't been around that many students at one time. And so uh, I, uh, I became aware of what a locker was, mm -hmm. of periods, and you had to walk from here to there to another classroom, where all the time we had our classroom in one room only to the, throughout the whole day. But uh, I met a lot of friends, and you know, it was a big eye-opener for me. Okay. Uh, what was your relationship to Anglo people in school and outside of school? I got along with them just fine. So did my dad. That was one of the values my dad taught me was... Uh, I uh, never put nobody down, never criticize anybody. In fact, become their friends. Just be friends. And uh, I never saw my dad argue with anybody or raise his voice to anyone. Uh, he was just a great guy. He got along with everybody. Okay. Do you think you saw some problems in high school between Anglos and Mexican Americans? Not at all. We all got along. Okay. <laughs> um, was school a different space that allowed for intercultural contact? What do you mean? I mean, sort of, did you feel that school was a space where people sort of shared their culture and their background? Do you think that's a place where people learned about uh, their peers' backgrounds? No, not at all. Okay. No. Um, what was your relationship to Spanish growing up and being educated in the Valley? Oh, let me tell you a little story here. In second grade, I actually got spanked by my teacher for speaking Spanish. Okay. And uh, what was ironic is that uh, later on, Spanish became part of the curriculum. Later on, I became a school board member and we were preaching it. Wow. But I was a, one of those victims uh, having spoken Spanish and then uh, spanked by the teacher. So that was like a, a rare incident. To it this day, I'll, I'll never forget that. It wasn't, an, uh, it wasn't too much of a spanking, but I mean, you were punished for it. Right. You know? And it was just one Spanish word that I said. Mm -hmm. I even forgot what the word is. Um, what do you think were some factors that contributed to the continued disparity and inequality of the region in relation to education resources? I think that overall our region was considered um, perfect for uh, training mechanical schools, uh, not necessarily professionals. I think they believed that we had a workforce mm -hmm. for that or a population and so Let's get those uh, training schools over there, 
train the people and maybe they can become professional welders, uh, medical assistants, things like that. Uh, but pretty much uh, professional schools, uh, they, 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 they didn't think we were ripe for it. Okay. Um, what was your experience at Pan American? At Pan American, not much other than just go to class, study, pass, and that's it. I, I, for four years, I, uh, I attended school, TNT, Tuesdays and Thursdays, okay. because I had work to do back home, right. and so I couldn't go that long. And it was just to go out there and pass. Uh, did you have any Anglo friends that went to local universities or colleges? Uh, no, not really. Okay. Um, so now I'd like to ask you some questions about your early career, if oh. we can go in that direction. Okay. All right. So can you give me an overview about your life as it relates to the changes that came about as part of the South Texas Border Initiative? Well, I, uh, as a teenager, I grew up uh, doing a lot of civic work um, to the point that you can say that I've been a public servant for well over 40 years, and uh, I'm 58 now. But uh, either a public servant or politician, either one, or maybe both of them together. Um, I don't know. I, I, I didn't grow up. Um, I didn't grow up seeing the fun part of education. I saw where people needed help. They were needy. Uh, didn't have their basic needs or improvements like drinking water or police protection, things like that. And so that put me to work in, uh, I guess, especially, be especially because uh, my degree in, 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 in Pan American was uh, government or political okay. science. And I thought that by getting involved with the community now, right now and now, right now and then, I think uh, that, that was going to be a great help. And it did help. Right. Um, how were you elected to the Mission School Board? And what was that experience That's like? That's another strange... Uh, experience, I'll tell you. Um, my first race was in 1984. I was not a parent. I was not a taxpayer. I didn't have children in school. I lived with my parents. And I lost that election by 20 votes, uh, 1477 to 1457. You don't forget when you lose an election. That was wow. an election I've lost in 40 years. But anyway, uh, I didn't work the early vote. I didn't work the mail ballots, things like that. Mm -hmm. That's where I lost it, but I won election day but I lost that election by 20 votes. So then a year later, I decided to run again, and at that point, I did not have an opponent. Mm -hmm. And so I won unopposed, actually four terms on the Mission School Board. Wow. So my loss in 84 propelled me to be the board member for the next 12 years. Okay. Uh, you said that you worked three jobs in school. What were your jobs, and what was your experience with work in school? Oh, man. It was pretty rough, because uh, I was like the manager and bookkeeper for three entities, mm -hmm. uh, for the uh, country uh, store that my father owned. Um, also, we had a farming business and also a land construction business. So I, I, I carry the books and I was a manager, but at any time you had to be, you had an, an employee who didn't show up, you got on top of that tractor or uh, you tended the, the, the people at the store and, and or you were the janitor. Mm -hmm. So yes, I had a title, but I work like anybody else. Okay. Uh, so you said that you helped incorporate the city of Alton when you were 18. Mm -hmm. How did that happen and what was it like? Okay. It got incorporated when I was 18, but we actually started working with the incorporation oh, okay. entity uh, or assignment uh, when I was like 17 or maybe even earlier. Okay. That's when I first met my uh, uh, good friend, attorney Brinkley Oxford. And uh, we had a meeting at somebody's house, and uh, well, we're, I was hearing things about we need the police, but they get there in two hours, or uh, there's no uh, plumbing in the houses, or there's no pavement in the streets, there's no fire protection, um, and so we were hearing all those stories, and, and and then we had a meeting. It was just me and the attorney and about four others, and we said, hey, how about incorporating? Attorney Brent Luxford already had already had experience incorporating other communities. And so Alton was one giant colonia where I attended school and where my friends, mostly my friends, were from. And I figured if I help this with this project, which is going to help me with my college anyway, uh, I'll be helping my friends, my relatives, and so right. forth that, that also live there. So uh, that was a battle. Um, 
We had town hall meetings, about three of them. Uh, I personally went to so many houses to deliver notice of the meeting so they could discuss the pros and cons of being incorporated. Um, then we did do, do a boundary of the proposed city limits. And I personally went to see all the stakes and ribbons for each of those corners of the proposed area. Mm -hmm. And then we had an election. And in that election, we won. Well, before that election, we needed permission from the county commissioners about what our plan was. We needed permission from the Department of Justice in Washington to tell them what we're going to do. And so once they gave us an approval, we had an election. That one, it was either to yes or no incorporate, mm -hmm. and we won. And so then after that, uh, we met at another house, and we talked about what we're going to do about the mayor and the commissioners and what, what not. Well, I was 18. Everybody looked at me and said, Fred, you've been involved with this since the beginning. You'll be the mayor. <laughs> and I said, well, I'm just 18, but I actually live outside of the city limits. I live in the seven-mile line area. But I'll help you guys with everything, like, just like I've been helping you with anything you need. Meetings, agendas, anything you need. And uh, so we were at Mrs. San Juanita Zamora's house, and I had a legal pad, and I wrote her name in there, Mrs. Zamora. you be the first mayor. So she was the first mayor that we had appointed. Then I asked Brinkley, the attorney, what do we need, commissioners or uh, what is it? Oh, councilmen. He said, no, we need aldermen. So we need four of them. I said, well, who are they going to be? Well, Joe is here. We put the name of Joe here. Mike is here. Larry is here and so forth. Now we need a city secretary. Who's going to be the city secretary? Well, Lesbia Perales is here. She's been helping us put her name here for the city secretary. And then um, Brinkley says, well, we need one more. I said, well, who's that? The city marshal. City marshal? This is not like Bonanza or a, a gun smoke or something. <laughs> he said, no, you first have to have a city marshal, and then from there you grow to the city department, police department. Mm -hmm. Well, who are we going to get? And we're looking at everybody there, and we really don't have anybody else. And there's an, uh, Mrs. Perales' husband, uh, Francisco, is sitting next to him, next to her. And he says, you know what? We just retired from Chicago, and we're coming down, down back home to Alton to take care of our parents. On the way here, I picked up this old helmet from the highway that I, and I said, you're it. You're going to be the city marshal. So we put down, you know, Francisco Perales or Frank Perales, city marshal. He was a police helmet. And so that qualified him. And so we put up our names again, Department of Justice approval, uh, county commissioner's approval, and nobody, and, and I guess you have to advertise because these are the people that are going to be running for office for the very first time. Anybody want to run against them, put your name in there or go start writing in the ballot. And uh, nobody did, and so everybody won. And then two years later, another election. Two years later, another election. What was happening there is that the people who did not want to incorporate wanted to win to disincorporate. And so we ended up winning, and then winning and winning. Finally, we said, let's run uh, uh, staggered terms. So two people run one time, three next time, and then the mayor, you know, staggered, not only one time. And we did that, and so uh, that's, that's the way it is. I mean, I could have been the mayor at 18, but I decided wow. not to. And I said, no, I think that's too much for me right now. Did you do any work in Alton after that election? Yes, I did. Uh, I was named the uh, director for the Alton Senior Citizens. I was mm -hmm. in charge of the Senior Citizens uh, Department. I uh, helped out with uh, bringing in uh, all folks to the uh, area. I talked to other cities and got to get some uh, vans, some uh, uh, vans that they gave us so that we could go and pick up and drop off the, the individuals. Um, I also uh, opened up the Alton's Lions Club. I helped create that too. And then I became secretary. And uh, the Planning and Zoning Commission, I was a member of the Planning and Zoning Commission. And I helped out with the meetings. I told them anything you need for me before the meetings or whatever, I'll be there. And yes, they all came to me for guidance. And so that was a lot of work. Okay. Can we, before we move on to the next question, just move sure. the mic up a little bit? It's kind of brushing up against the seat. Oh, okay. We're getting a little, okay. a little bit of fuzz. Okay. So we'll just move it up slightly, just so it brushes less. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, if we can move on, I'd like to ask you some questions about the law school, Ronaldo Garza Law School. Okay. So what was the Ronaldo Garza Law School like when you went there, and what was your experience like there? All right. The Ronaldo Garza Law School, uh, was somewhat of an experience that I think nobody else will ever experience or go through. Uh, think about it this way. Uh, we were students that were trying to learn the law so we could become lawyers. 
but at the same time working hard to keep the law school operating. Mm -hmm. Now your typical law student will, will, will sign up for law school, pay the semester tuition, and just go to law school to learn the law. For us, it was, it was, uh, it was a battle, I would say. Uh, number one, we had to keep working, paying our bills with our families. Number two, uh, pay two or three thousand dollars a semester for law school when we're actually rolling the dice because at any given moment the doors would clo could, could close. And so uh, it was somewhat of an experience. I mean, it, it was difficult uh, in the sense that uh, uh, we as students had to lobby legislators, uh, talk to our legislators or go to Austin and talk to other people to help us with our school, help us uh, get it accredited. Um, the board of directors would go talk to, or the deans of the law school would go talk to other presidents of other universities to try to get us merged or affiliated. Mm -hmm. And so that happened for the, the three years I was there. It almost happened on a continuous basis. I mean, we, we tried hard to keep this thing alive. And uh, up until we had a visit from four justices of the Supreme Court, and they uh, pretty much uh, saw the facilities and they pretty much told us the only way you're going to survive is to merge or affiliate with another university, which we had been doing. And, uh, he's, but they said, look, we, we, we see how you guys are, are involved here. You're, you, we, I admire your, your uh, determination. You guys are paying for something you may not know you're going to get. Uh, you're working hard. Uh, I'll tell you what, we'll give you guys a waiver. We're going to waive the ABA requirements, American Bar Association requirements and let you take the bar exam in Austin, uh, but only for the 88 and the 89 graduating classes. Now, we were supposed to graduate in 90 because it was a four-year night school program that we had enrolled. Um, we had a meeting with the, with the faculty, and we're like 30 students left because as the years went by, some left, some came, some went to other schools. Um, but we were 30 students left, and we said, how can we hurry up so we can finish with 89? And I said, well, we're going to take more hours. We're going to do this. Um, I know the classes were from 5.30 to 9 o'clock every night. We might have to start at 4 and finish, or finish at 10. And on Saturdays, it was 9 to 1, maybe come in at 8 to 1. And so we did. I, I took 32 hours that last uh, a year so I could go in, uh, fall through the wow. 80, 89 uh, group. And so I managed to take the, I graduated May 20th, 1989, took the bar exam July 89, and got my results uh, November 89. So okay, became a lawyer in 1990. So eventually the law school was unaccredited by Can this. Pause for a second. Yeah. No. Yes, so uh, eventually the law school was unaccredited by the state bar. Uh, why was that? Well, uh, the, law the law school was always unaccredited. Okay. It never became accredited. Okay. Uh, uh, but you guys were able to sign the waiver to take that. Yes, we were able to get the blessing of the Supreme Court to take the, the bar exam without being accredited. So, so that would give us more time to continue talking to the university so we could merge or affiliate, mm -hmm. uh, which was our best hope to be accredited. Um, but after that, uh, uh, it, it became unaccredited. I became an attorney, and I and I still helped out as an adjunct professor mm -hmm. for the law school. Okay, were there some students that weren't allowed to graduate from the law school? Uh, well, those that didn't finish left. Some went to other universities and still carried over their hours that they had earned mm -hmm. in Reynaldo Garza Law School over to the uh, the new law school, and that worked out fine. But some students went ahead and graduated and could not take the bar exam. Right. Uh, you know. They weren't as lucky. After students started leaving the law school, I know uh, I read that enrollment dropped from mm -hmm. 60 to 32. Uh, why was there a shakeup in the staff after that? Why did the staff get moved around? Well, I mean, people just simply got tired of waiting and waiting. Uh, they, they saw that we weren't uh, going to get a, uh, affiliated with anybody. I mean, it got to the point where um, our dean or board of directors would talk to presidents of other universities and they were like negotiating, mm -hmm. and just about when, we're, when uh, we were going to have a deal, uh, it just didn't work out. And that was like three or four times that it happened during the time I was there. And 
at the same time we were going to Austin and lobbying our, our legislators and other legislators to help us with the law school, there was also the battle of public education, MALDEF and what whatnot. Right. And so everybody wanted a piece of the pie that I guess wasn't big enough for all of us. Mm -hmm. And so it, we've, they saw the right on the wall and said, look, two classes got accredited. It ain't going to happen again because some that graduated after us did lobby the Supreme Court mm -hmm. and said, look, you gave them a break. Can you do that? No, we're not going to. So they didn't get a break. And uh, so, yeah, it, it, but the student population just dwindled, right. dwindled and dwindled until it moved elsewhere. Um, of the school students who did take the bar, about 25% passed compared to the state average that was 75%. No, I think that is wrong. You do? Uh, not 25%. Maybe 25 students of the 30 students that took the bar exam passed. Okay. So it was pretty high. It was around 80. Okay. 80, 90%. Really? Yeah. All right. Yeah. Um, the Bar Association requires that a law has that a law school has a legitimate campus and a sufficient library needed to prepare for the bar exam. Is it true that the law school didn't have these resources? Did not. Uh, actually, we did, but there was just uh, a very very small amount mm -hmm. of facilities that did not add up to the ABA requirements. Uh, when I first started law school in '86, we were having classes at the business department at Pan American University. I mean, that was like the auditorium type of seating, and we're like 65 students. That was the largest class ever of the law school. Uh, after that, uh, we moved to the some temporary buildings also at the Pan American University campus. And then Pan American was one of those campuses that we lobbied to merge with us, and it came close. It was a five to four vote against merging. And so then after that, we could no longer stay in the Pan American uh, right. uh, uh, area. So the city of Edinburgh went ahead and rented us uh, the old Pan American College uh, that was just uh, out there uh, deteriorating. Mm -hmm. But they turned out the turned out the electricity, and uh, they allowed us to go to have classes in there. Wow! Like folding chairs, folding tables, just a, I mean, it was just. And at that area, that's where the justices came to see us about a year later. Mm -hmm. You know, so not much of facilities. Yes, we knew we needed a big library, and uh, faculty. We had faculty members. Uh, qualified faculty from Mason University, and uh, we had about five of them full time, maybe six, uh, but a lot of them were adjunct professors who were lawyers from the community who were helping out as well. So you guys weren't able to affiliate with Pan American? No, it was a close vote, five to four, and I can recall that all of us were in the board meeting there with the Board of Regents uh, w watching the vote, and we were hoping we'd get accredited. But way before the vote, um, uh, there was too much. Uh, too much debate. Mm -hmm. uh, someone what role school. did the University of Texas play in that debate? Uh, pretty much, they stayed out of it. Okay. They, the regions were, were not the UT regions we have now. They were our local regions, but uh, they pretty much stayed out of it. it there were the communities, our, our bar association, uh, a lot of members of the lawyers uh, did back the law school, uh, but you had a lot of city people and other city leaders who did not, and they made it very clear you know, on TV and newspapers, magazines. So we knew the vote was going to be close, and it was close, but against our, not in our favor. Okay. Yeah. Um, the law school had students sign a disclaimer stating, the university makes no representation that its students may take the Texas bar exam to be licensed as an attorney. Correct. Did you sign that? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, do you still keep in touch with your graduating class? Yes. Uh, not all of them, of course, because some of them have moved out. Mm -hmm. uh, quite a few of them come before me in court. Uh, they, uh, they show up, and we were colleagues in, in law school, and so they practice law in my courtroom. And then there's a couple of them that still show up in court who are my teachers. Wow. So, yeah, we, I still keep up with them. Uh, did you know anyone that went to San Antonio School of Law? Uh, you mean St. Mary's? Uh, or St. Antonio School of Law, I'm not familiar with. Okay. Uh, what about St. Mary's? Uh, well, when we first started in August 86, when we all enrolled at Reynaldo Garza Law School, mm -hmm. which was having night classes at Pan American University, uh, we were 65 students. Uh, a good 30 of us were from the valley, and a good 30 were from out of the valley. So it wasn't just a law school for the valley students. It right. was people from out, out of town that were coming over here. Uh, which reminds me, 
in trying to get the school affiliated or getting support from the legislature, uh, some of us students didn't think that, that our administrators or board of directors were doing enough. So a lot of them went on their own, mm -hmm. talking to legislators, talking to universities from out of town, out of state. They were like, I don't think you're doing enough here to, to, to survive. So I'm going to take it upon myself. And they did. So uh, I think eventually when the law school did leave, late 96, 95, uh, it went to uh, Dallas, Fort Worth. Yeah. You know. So you became a lawyer in 1990. 1990. Uh, what are some memorable cases you had and how did you get started? Memorable cases. Golly, I did everything. I, I, I started working with an attorney, Edinburgh attorney, who then moved to McAllen. Um, I started helping him doing research. I did some, uh, I did some court appearances for him. Uh, memorable cases? Not really. We did a lot of personal injury cases, but also divorce cases, uh, wills and trust, uh, things like that. Uh, uh, as an attorney, I was already a member of the Mission School Board. And so was he. He was a member of the McAllen School Board. And so we had that in common. But eh, just a lot of work, a lot of office work. Okay. Uh, so now I want to ask you some questions about the Lulac v. Richards case, if I can. Uh, do you know how the law school intervened in that case, how Ronaldo Garza did? Um, if I can, uh, I don't recall other than we joined the lawsuit because mm -hmm. The other schools or entities or parties of the lawsuit were in the same position we were. We were looking for more funding. Okay. And, uh, and we felt like we were being uh, disregarded or uh, uh, let down. And so uh, uh, that's why we joined the lawsuit. But the details, I don't know too much about them. Okay. Uh, were you involved in that case at all? No. Okay. Um, how did the school board in your mind, interfere with the law school's degree granting authority, if you think they did. Which law school, which school board? Ronaldo Garza and the, higher, and the Higher Education Board. Okay, I think that when the school was first started, it was back in uh, 1982 or 83, mm -hmm. it was started in Brownsville, named after our federal judge, Ronaldo Garza. Uh, when the charter was started, or the incorporation of that law school was started, it was done so without the consent of the legislature or the higher education, higher, edu higher education coordinating board. And so from day one, I believe uh, we were going to have an uphill battle trying to get their support because they're the ones in charge of, you know, accreditation uh, issues. You know, I mean, even when a school starts, you need two or three years during your fledgling years to prove to them mm -hmm. you're, you're going the right path. And so then they'll give you the certificate, you're accredited. So not having gotten their consent from day one, I think that's just where, that, that is where we, we had our problem, our main problem. Okay. Uh, if you can answer this question, what is or was the relationship between the judges in the Lulac v. Richards case and the community? Mm, not familiar with that. Do you, do you remember what judges were on the case? Uh, there was one judge that I knew his name, but I forgot already. Okay. But I, 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 I don't know. Don't okay. Uh, in that case, plaintiffs allege discrimination in the allocation of resources in undergraduate, graduate, and professional programs to mm -hmm. the border area schools. Yes. Specifically, they contended that defendants had placed academic programs in physical facilities where they were largely inaccessible to border area residents and had funded the institutions in the border area at lower levels than other institutions. Uh, can you elaborate on what disparities in resources were, there were? Well, with, res with respect to our school, uh -huh. we knew from day one we, we had a small library, we had a small faculty, we, we wanted to incorporate, I'm sorry, to uh, affiliate with another university so that then they could uh, help us with that, the space that we needed. Uh, we were hoping that we could be a branch of Loyola University, Texas A&I, uh, Kingsville, for example, or some other school in the Panhandle, but uh, just affiliated so we could get recognized, and then uh, uh, you know, uh, and then you know, then we would wouldn't would, we wouldn't be worrying about those facilities 
that we're talking about where we're lacking or we're right. behind. We knew we were behind everything. But as, but as far as international, let's say, students, for example, I remember when we first uh, 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 started our class in 86, a good four or five students were from Mexico, Monterrey or something like that. We did have students from Mexico coming over to Arnaldo Garza Law School. Okay. Uh, do you think the Higher Education Coordinating Board's policies and practices toward the law school impaired equal availability of legal education to Mexican Americans in South Texas? I don't want to say to Mexican Americans. Just to I the just region. Want to, say to our area in okay. general. Right. Yeah. Uh, do you think the lawsuit improved education in the valley, and how? It did. Uh, I mean, uh, even uh, well, the the main parties here were the public, were the school districts that uh, taught uh, public education, and then of course people joined in the lawsuit like we did. So uh, yeah, I think that uh, I'm trying to think of the name of the judge, but. Uh, he's the one that found that there were disparities and uh, yeah, there wasn't uh, equal funding and so forth. But he got to the point where they forced the school districts to raise their property taxes, collect more, mm -hmm. take it to Austin, then we'll give you more. Which was, yeah, we got more, all right, but we had to put more into the kitty by raising our, our tax rate, for example. Mm -hmm. That was one area that I remember that was pretty odd, but we, we did get more funding but we had to raise our tax rate higher. Okay. Um, in more recent years, how do you think that these efforts have taken root in the community? Uh, well, uh, like I said earlier, uh, just about a year ago, the Higher Education uh, Coordinating Board finally realized that uh, the area does need a law school, for example. Uh, right now, we just started a medical school in the Valley uh, pretty soon we're going to have, in, well, we're going to have engineering, but a and will open its doors next year in 2018, and they're going to bring in uh, engineering and veterinarian school. And so I think all these efforts, all these efforts that were uh, uh, started a long time ago, along with what we have today, uh, is going to produce a law school pretty soon, in my opinion. Okay. It's going to be between a and M. Well, a and M already has a law school. a and M went ahead and... Uh, took over Westland Law School, or School of Law, which used to be us a long time ago. And so uh, I think A&M might want to uh, open, open up something up, up in McAllen. Okay. You know. Um, what did you think of the Chief Justice's ruling in favor of the defendants in the LULAC versus Richards case? Did you agree with the ruling? Uh, I, I'm not too familiar with the ruling. What was the ruling? Okay, so like you had said, uh, the judge did rule that there were disparities between resources and how the southern region of Texas received resources from the state right. and the other parts of the state. Right. But he didn't say that it was because of discrimination. Okay. Right. So you, did you agree with that? Uh, I agree with it. Okay. I agree with it. I think the area in general was just uh, ig being ignored. It wasn't given its fair share of the education pie. Right. Uh, if we can go back to talking about the Reynaldo Garza Law School. Okay. So how did that school come together in the first place? Uh, like I said, it started back in 82 or 83 in Brownsville. And then from there, uh, it went to Edinburgh. And, uh, and then from Edinburgh to West Laco and, 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 and San Benito. Mm -hmm. uh, but how it started, I understand... Uh, a few folks, maybe five folks, got together and uh, got an incorporation started, but well, they call it a charter. And with that, uh, they started uh, looking for applicants and, uh, and, and, and enrollment. How did you hear about it? All right. I was in one of my businesses. I was tending a customer at the uh, Chaparral Country Store. Uh, and one of the customers was one of the students from, or one of the future students that was coming from Raymondville. And he told me, he said, did you hear that there's a law school coming to your, your Pan American? I said, no, I have not. He said, yeah, it's going to start in August. You ought to go check it out and see what's going on. Well, I had already finished Pan American in 81. I had already taken some uh, night classes in real estate. Um, I had gone to uh, McCrary Air Aviation to get some flight books. I was going to start learning how to fly, how to fly. And, but when he said that about the law school coming pretty soon, and it's going to be, it's going to start August of 86. I said, let me take a look at it. 
So I went to it. It was in my mind. It was not in my, th my mind or my, my desire to go to law school to be a lawyer. The law school was there, so I just saw it and I went to it. You know? Before you knew about the law school, what were you planning on in terms of a career? I loved teaching. I wanted to teach uh, civics or history mm -hmm. or government in high school, college, something like that. Okay. What were your siblings doing around the time when you went to law school? Uh, they were already at, some were attending Pan American University and some were already out. So they were teaching already. And um, all six of us went to Pan American University. And I think to this date, we hold the record. Uh, six graduates from the same family. Wow. Well, we got, we got uh, honored by the uh, Pan American uh, Alumni Association for, uh, for having six students graduate from Pan American. Wow. The whole family. Uh, is there anything else that you would like to talk about in terms of the law school or the court well, case? In terms of the law school, uh, I mean, it, it was amazing that, uh, that even after uh, we graduated, we became attorneys and then judges after that. Mm -hmm. It was like I was the first judge, I think, I want to say in modern history, that did not leave the Valley to get a law degree and get educated like in San Antonio, Houston. I stayed here all my life, ran for office, uh, for judge, and here I am 30, uh, 22 years later. And I was the first one. Then came Judge Rudy Gonzalez, Judge Jay Palacios, and Judge Arnold Cantu. And so for a while there, the majority of the judges, county court law judges, were from Reynaldo Garza Law School. So um, if you, if you want to uh, say that the proof was in the pudding, uh, I think it's, it was us. And so, but that's why I went back to law school to teach as an adjunct professor to try to help it out and say, I mean, mm -hmm. I, I did it. I, it went well for me. Maybe if I stick around with these guys, uh, we can do it again. What mm -hmm. did your parents think about the law school if you mentioned it to them when you heard about it? Uh, they thought it was a great idea. Yeah. Uh, many of my friends encouraged me to go to law, law school. In fact, uh, one of my customers there at the country store was Dr. Lauro Guerra, who actually delivered me. Uh, he asked me the question, what are you going to be doing? I said, Dr. Um, I'll be hopefully teaching high school or college or something after I'm done here with all these businesses. He said, you're wrong. You ought to go to law school. I said, yeah, people have told me to go to law school. You ought to go to law school. In fact, I'm going to get you a meeting with Judge Rinaldo Garza, who is a, uh, a federal judge in Brownsville. I said, okay, get the meeting. So he got a meeting. He calls me about a week later and says, hey, you're going to go see him on a Tuesday morning, 9 o'clock. Go to this highway, go to this building. There's going to be a lot of security. Be ready for that. But he's going to meet you. And he's going to talk to you about law school. I said, well, why not? So I went. I saw him. A tall, tall, towering man. <laughs> and a deep, deep voice. And he said, hey, I'm glad you made it. I said, well, thank you for the invite. I'm, I'm honored because he was very close to my doctor. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, no, 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 you, I mean, law school, you're going to have opportunities, you're going to do this, you're going to make things for yourself. I, I was already a community activist or, or public servant, already as it was, but then he said, no, 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 with a law degree and things like that, you're going to help out more people. I know you're a board member, school board member, and I know a lot of them from the mission uh, in the Valley area, so uh, try it, you ought to go. Uh, so I can say, yeah, even, even, even the gentleman whose name, whose school was named after, Encouraged me to go to law school. Wow. So you mentioned that you were involved in politics before you went to law school, even while you were in high school, maybe. So do you think that gave you a leg up when you were at the law school, and did other students in your class know that about you? Yeah, they knew that about me because I was missing at least once a month. That's when we had our regular school board meetings. And so the professor went ahead and uh, gave me an excuse so I could go to the board meetings. And so... Uh, I enrolled in law school as a board member for Mission School District, uh, and I became an attorney still, and I was still a board member of Mission School District, so I never left. And, but I have a lot of friends who left for law school elsewhere. They had to drop off, dr get off from all those boards, and then go, go for two or three years, come back as an attorney, and then run for office again. I never did. It never like interrupted me at all. Okay. Yeah. So do you think any of your peers or colleagues would say they had a bad experience at Ronaldo Garza? Well. Those of us that went ahead and gradu uh, graduated and were able to take the bar exam are not going to complain. Right. I mean, we were lucky. We were, we, there was a blessing from, from the Supreme Court justices. But I think those who uh, did not finish, those who left elsewhere to finish, 
uh, those who ended up graduating and couldn't take the bar anywhere uh, would be the, the persons who may have a, okay. a problem. Uh, if I can ask you a question about the Pan-American merger. Mm -hmm. uh, what were the stated reasons for opposing Ronaldo Garza Law School's merger with Pan-American? What I was hearing out there was that we have too many lawyers already. Okay. Uh, number two, at the time the vote happened, uh, you had a bunch of signs up there on the highways talking about lawsuit abuse. So I think that didn't help either. And so that was easy to rally the forces against a law school. So, uh, I mean, you had city elected officials in the city or the county who were against it, just like some lawyers were actually against mm -hmm. it. But uh, we knew when the vote was going to come, it was going to be close. Uh, it was going to be a five to four vote, we thought, but it was not in our favor. The funny thing is two board members from our area voted against it and one lady from Dallas voted for it. And so you would think, well, the lady from the outside voted for it, and you two from your own neighborhood did not. If one of them had voted yes, that would have done it. Do you remember why they didn't? Was it the same reason? I never got the reasons. I never asked them personally. Okay. And sometimes I see them around town, and I just don't want to talk to them. <laughs> <laughs> when this was still an issue, do you remember how the community felt about the law school? Out yeah. Uh, well, the community in general wanted a law school, mm -hmm. but the powers that be were the ones that, you know, uh, yes, some, yes, no, some, and that was a problem right there. Our legislators as a whole were for it, okay. but there's only about four or five of them here in the valley compared to 150. That was tough. I really, really think that our biggest obstacle was the fact that the law school was started without the consent of the legislature okay. or the higher education coordinator board. Okay. I think from day one, that was like a black eye, and we were going to have an uphill battle running with the unaccredited law school. Right. Uh, if I can go back and ask you some questions about high school. Okay. Uh, you said that all students at your high school got along regardless of their ethnicity? Absolutely. Do you think that was rare for the time? Well, uh, the population, our, 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 our high school was 95% Mexican-American okay. and 5% Anglo. Okay. Uh, we all got along with them, with everybody. Okay. Yeah. Um, did school administration or teachers ever treat students of different ethnicities differently? Uh, I, think they, I think they did. Okay. I remember one of my counselors uh, telling me, well, because I came from the Alton area. That was like the rural part of town, mm -hmm. I mean, the county. And so everybody came from that area. Uh, they didn't think that they would be uh, smart. Uh, in fact, out of 365 students, I was number nine you know, uh, top 10 graduate. Mm -hmm. And, um, but yeah, I had a counselor tell me uh, when I said, maybe one day I could do this or do that. I don't remember saying law school, but uh, I don't forgot what I said, but she was telling me, no, 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 you need to stick to uh, uh, something that is uh, uh, like farming or something or uh, uh, low wage paying job. Something like, I forgot what it was exactly. But she did, or go to the army. She did not encourage me to go to professional school. When she said that, do you remember feeling like she she, th she didn't think she was being discriminatory? Was that natural for her to say that? How she I did? I think, think it was kind of natural for her to say that. Yeah. But I caught it, and it gave me more motivation to do more right. for myself. In fact, after I became a school board member, that counselor was still working there, and. Uh, and uh, I left, became an attorney, and that board and that counselor was still there. So it's almost like, uh, who who are you telling not to? You know, they cannot do better or whatever. When I did all these things, and you're still in the same place right. year after year. You know. Okay. Never told it to anybody's face or anything like that. Right. But, you know, there was something that caught my attention. Okay. Uh, is there anything else you want to talk about related to growing up, uh, related to the law school or related to the lawsuit? Anything else you think we should know? Uh, let's see here. Uh, well, um, we're a, we're a few uh, proud gang of uh, of graduates from law school because we did it the hard way. Uh, it could have been worse because we couldn't have if we weren't getting if we weren't given a waiver, it could have been worse for us. But uh, uh, I, I just feel proud of my colleagues. 
uh, lawyers and judges because we stuck to our guns and uh, we fought and fought and we, 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 we tried to do the right thing. It didn't work, but we were given a waiver and that was fine with us. But um, I, for one, went back to law school, uh, keeping it alive by being an adjunct professor and, uh, and did what I could. What was your experience like as an adjunct professor? How long did you do that? Uh, three years. Okay. Three years. 90, let's see here, 92, 93, 94, three years. Yeah. And so I was happy to do that because I saw how other lawyers in our community mm -hmm. were doing it to us when we were students. I said, I can do that. That was once a night each week you know, per semester. It's interesting to me that some lawyers in the community opposed the law school. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Do you think they thought their jobs were threatened or their clients? They probably thought, uh, hey, we got too many lawyers, for example, and so, uh, uh, yeah, I may not, uh, I don't want to share my work with somebody else or, or maybe just, uh, I don't know. I mean, Did the Valley have enough lawyers? No. Right. No. All the studies concluded that we did not have enough lawyers. And so uh, we did marry it at a law school back then. Mm -hmm. I mean, we brought out examples like San Antonio has a law school. Houston has three of them within I don't know how many blocks. Uh, Dallas has one in Waco. Texas Tech in uh, Arm uh, Lubbock has one. And there we are. We're more populated than Texas Tech, you know. So, but it could have been an enduring NEFTA. It could have been an international law school because we're already getting students from Mexico. Mm -hmm. We could have gotten even more if we get accredited. Yeah. You know. Uh, it could be in a, uh, an international law school with emphasis in trade, commercial, you know, things like that. So, oh, I think we always needed a law school. It's just that the opinions out there were all over. Right. All right, well, that's my last question. Thank you so much for talking. Appreciate it. Yeah. Well, my honor. All right. Wow, it wasn't.